Good morning. Good morning, Christian. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Are we late? Oh, yeah. I was just preparing the. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. I have to change my name. Should we start, Nikolai, or we're waiting for Paul, I think? Morning. If you want to start, morning, Eva. It's, it's uh, depends on your choice. If you repeat this and Christian. You are already in uh, live on Facebook. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe we can give a couple of minutes for people to come from other sessions. Can I try to share my screen and I will unshare it just to, to make a technical. Yeah. Okay, Do you see it right? Okay. I will share it now if this is possible. Uh, share just a second. Now should not be shared according to. Thank you. 
Okay, welcome everybody to our third keynote lecture of the conference. Professor Christian Van Gogh will um, talk about um, a proposal for a semi-economic analysis of an interactive experience. We had a very interesting introduction yesterday in the roundtable discussion. Therefore, we are looking forward in listening to more details of this work in progress. Professor Christian, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Every Peters. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming in this early hour to the uh, my presentation. Now, as I anticipated yesterday, this is really let's say, innovative approach. I was glad to see that uh, one of the uh, virtues of semiotics according to the uh, editor-in-chief of Semiotica, Massimo Leone, was to be bold, to dare, to innovate. And I would say that probably this is the biggest virtue for the rest. Um, ever since, since I study economic issues from semiotic point of view, I know that uh, people from humanities are quite uh, reluctant to deal with economic issues. So please give me a chance to involve you in this approach. Uh, the overall idea is to um, open semiotics to more, let's say, present day issues to start to be a bit difficult to teach semiotics in universities where uh, the major purpose of students is to find a job afterwards. So uh, we have a very good media uh, majors and in this media majors in graphic design, uh, students are interested in uh, semiotics as far as it goes into the uh, new media reality and uh, digital uh, uh, forms of, uh, of expression as far as it is a bit translated to the new, uh, new vocabulary. It, it is really difficult to keep the classical semiotic vocabulary and to involve uh, such kind of, of students. So the context is a bit distorted. This is not a very uh, you know, conventional talk uh, among semioticians. So I'm a bit trying to introduce you the way I'm looking for expanding the semiotic method in order to, uh, let's say, propose semiotics uh, to larger publics. And I did this for many years with semiotics of brand and branding. And now this reality, uh, which is the interactive experiences is uh, at stake. Let's see now the motion, the, the, the notions I'm trying to use. What I intend with interactive experience, this is a staged interactive experience designed for serial commercial use. Now, serial is very uh, important and uh, my colleagues in Italy uh, developed this in semiotic terms and they have a very good, uh, there was a conference and um, edition on the seriality which is something, uh, the way commercialization of everyday life and of culture takes place. And, uh, you know, the big commercial success of uh, the, 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 these huge uh, internet companies, which today are on top of, of every uh, economic uh, comparison, comes from the fact that they are very efficient to uh, put our everyday life, our everyday experience, our uh, interpersonal communication, our identity creation, all things which make part of our everyday routines to put them into um, algorithmic environment where uh, these uh, activities of ours might be um, transformed into seriality, into predictability, into uh, calculable data. That's why um, I think uh, as far as digital culture advances, 
our everyday life will be um, in will be shaped as a serial uh, interactive experience. Okay, just one part, but important and part with a, a growing role. Now, another term, which I know it's uh, kind of uh, this uh, used by everybody uh, notion, which nobody knows what exactly means, but still this is another reality, which uh, helps to understand what I mean with um, serial interactive experiences, what our everyday life is transformed by uh, companies. Gamification, gamification, it, it is just one occurrence of uh, the process I'm uh, trying to put into semiotic frame. It's a strategic attempt to enhance systems, services, organization, and activities in order to create similar experiences to those who experienced when playing games in order to motivate and engage users. So gamifications transform any kind of serious activities into uh, with the rules of games in order to uh, make them more involving, more competitive, uh, more closer to the everyday expectations of especially new generations, which are already very, very much uh, habituated to uh, gaming experiences. So gamification is uh, the transformation of culture into uh, digital experiences which are shareable and which are available uh, for, uh, let's say, commercial and other type of manipulations. The expansion. So game and uh, I hope some colleagues from Turin, from which I learned a lot about semiotics of, of, of games uh, is here around. Gamification means that uh, our lives gradually are getting the shape of a huge video game, although not so explicit as it might seem. That's why in uh, further in this uh, presentation, I will just give examples with uh, how might a video game look uh, from a point of view of the semi-economic analysis. Uh, Another important issue on which I will not go deeper is the new model of sign, which is necessary in order to um, develop this kind of semi-economic analysis. Um, semi-economic analysis uh, of experiences rely on a different type of sign, the one which represents economic value. Now, this is one of the variations. It is just to illustrate it looks like that it's quite complicated i'm uh, echo let's say um, a semiotician who follows echo so this model looks very much like echo's model it's very complicated very difficult to apply but still uh, truthful to the uh, model reality and those are the titles again just to illustrate from the last four years of my publications, which I dedicated to define this sign. So uh, before, you know, rejecting it, you need to reject it only after reading all these uh, materials in order to uh, understand, well, here I don't have uh, enough time, although uh, the length of this uh, keynote speech is to go with it. So please trust me, this is a very developed uh, topic. Now, the, who is the antagonist of this presentation? I, as I have uh, anticipated yesterday, um, what I think is the utmost uh, expression of the semiotic analysis so far, private opinion, I don't want to engage anyone with this opinion. This is the um, generative method. Uh, the method of uh, Gray Mass and the Paris School, uh, further developed by Jean Marie Flores, who, uh, again, private opinion, he's more important to develop this method of analysis to export it from the closely linguistic uh, literary uh, environment to the everyday culture, to the commercial culture, uh, to the uh, pop culture. This is Jean Marie Flores. And thanks to, to Flosch, I think we have the, the, the strongest insights in uh, semiotic analysis. But uh, unfortunately, 
John Murray Walsh uh, didn't uh, lift enough for a great sorrow for all semiotic community to get into the digital culture and to social media because he passed away in I think 2001 or anywhere here. So expanding this uh, incredible uh, systematic and uh, very uh, efficient analytical model to interactive culture is might be the definition of this very innovative attempt as you will see, uh, very uh, important parts of the uh, model of, of the theory of semiotic theory will be substituted by others, which does not sound at all semiotic. Yet, can we get into the interactive world with semiotic models? To do this, I think we need to uh, distinguish interactivity from textuality. And in these many papers which were listed in the slide before, uh, I spent uh, quite many pages to uh, oppose the textualist model and to show that uh, although there are apparently quite acceptable, quite convincing applications of the textualist model in digital culture, yet they lose the essence of interactivity as I see it. And a few years ago, we had a, a, an entire conference on the um, digital culture, uh, culture and uh, um, digital age in semiotics and communication. And where uh, among the guest lecturers, there was Simone Arcani, who is not semiotician in the, let's say, orthodox uh, uh, sense of the word, but he wrote very important books on digital culture and understanding the essence of digital culture. So with, with him, we start this enterprise to put the interactivity, the, the principle of interactivity into the core of digital culture, into the uh, substantial dif distinctive feature of digital culture, which uh, distinguish it from the textual culture, from this uh, incredible adventure of semiotics uh, which took place in the 20th century and which was uh, around the notion of text. So those were the, the, the glorious times of semiotics. You know, when, when the semiotics was uh, uh, textualist semiotics and when uh, textualists like uh, Derrida and the construction and everybody were around the notion of text. And the notion of text was, you know, Gremas and Derrida are almost, uh, the opposite one to another, but both have a slogans which are more or less the same. There is no outside text. There is no salvation outside the text. So um, this textualist glorious, uh, let's say, developments of, uh, of semiotics, probably they were so successful. So many people were attracted in semiotics. There were thousands of students in, in humanities and in um, literary studies and uh, philosophy, nothing compared to that. At least my observation is that uh, we're losing a lot of ground on this uh, level. Uh, my university, okay, it's a private university, probably the reality is distorted, but uh, believe me, I have also uh, some views on the state university. It's the same thing that, that there are, humanities are not bringing to the uh, applicable, uh, desirable knowledges and skills today. So the, the, the glory of these models a bit create an inertia, which now push many of our colleagues to work on digital culture, but very dogmatically obeying the uh, textuality, the textualist model. So that's why I am spending uh, certain uh, efforts to uh, trying to understand nothing uh, taking from the textualist uh, model, but trying just to find out why uh, it might be improved with uh, understanding the uh, interactivity. Uh, interactivity is text which is not fixed. It's a, a sequence which is still a cultural product. Uh, after being recorded, the um, uh, interactive experiences actually can be easily analyzed with the structural analysis, with this textualist analysis. But when they are already passed, we have lost 
their dynamics. We have lost their uh, essence. This is my point. So yes, when you have you know this kind of channels where they broadcast uh, uh, gameplay and you take a record of a gameplay and then you start to analyze it semiotically, maybe you can uh, find uh, a lot of similarities with, with other, uh, let's say, classical textual experiences, but yet it is not. Now, uh, I see interaction as when you are inside the narrative in a way that uh, uh, the, the, the narrative programs like qualification, performance, and sanction, and sanction depend upon your decisions, upon your skills and management of scarce resources. Now, management of scarce resources is the key notion. At least for this presentation, I try to uh, imagine how a narrative program into a interactive experience might look like. Just follow the time. So what is a narrative program in the interactive experience? Now in Gremas and Cortez, the, let's say, I would call it the canonical model, if you don't mind. The canonical model, this is the um, basic element of any, you know, sense making process. In this approach, the uh, meaningful reality which surrounds us is articulated into texts. The text is an amount of science or the text is a I mean, slice of uh, semiotic reality, which might be uh, considered into a structural organization with common meaningful purpose. Uh, you know, to, to take a text as Jean-Marie Floch claims when he analyzes the uh, traveling into Paris Metro, he says it's enough that you have a beginning and an end. Then whatever happens within a beginning and an end, it might be uh, considered as a text. And this text is a composition of big number of narrative uh, programs. Now, there are the base narrative programs and there are the um, supplementary or the, um, what was the term, the um, supportive secondary narrative uh, programs. Yet any textual reality might be decomposed on a semi-narrative level can be decomposed to this scheme in which uh, subjects of action uh, can make or are subject of junction, uh, conjunction or disjunction with the object of value. You see, this is the um, basic element, the reducing on a semi-narrative level, the uh, process of meaning generation uh, Gremas and Cortez, uh, in order to achieve this uh, level of pertinence in their analysis, uh, they presuppose only these operations, junction or disjunction. The subject of state is uh, uh, either in conjunction or disjunction. There is a narrative percourse, a narrative trajectory when uh, object of value passes from one subject to another and this uh, transfer of the object uh, of value justifies the overall course of the mm, narrative or of the uh, meaning making uh, process because it's not always uh, about uh, what we call narrative in our everyday life as we will see. Now according to the semi-economic approach, which I'm trying to, to define, probably we need to go in this basic cell of the semiotic theory, which is the narrative program, and to start to look for analogies which still go beyond the conjunction and disjunction, because it's um, normal to have conjunction and disjunction when the textual reality is fixed in, write, in written form, when you work on the dead body of the fixed text. A text can be extremely dynamic meaning making tool, machine, device, but uh, we would never call a text something which is not fixed in a written form. So when it's 
fix it in a written form. Conjunction and disjunction are ways to understand its internal functioning as when we make in biology a dissection and we see how things are there, but we don't see their work in progress. Now, according to this approach, uh, actually, the, um, when we are into interactive experience, and this is quite a large notion, there is productive performance and consumption of resources. Somehow, um, according to me, this is where the big difference uh, stays. The objects of value are present also in um, interactive experiences, and I will illustrate all this with video games, but believe me, this gamification process shows that we can identify um, uh, the same elements of uh, interactive experience also in um, realities which are far from the video game, just the video game industry, its uh, rise, its uh, incredible proliferation in the last decades is indication that um, digital culture is transforming everyday life into something with the structure of interactive experience and game. So what might be a productive uh, uh, performance? Now, it makes difference when you're inside an interactive experience, imagine a game, whether you're doing things or you're not doing things, whether you have resources on disposition, usually we have when uh, we are uh, into an interactive uh, experience, it's interactive because it depends on you what you can uh, use in order to achieve certain goals. These goals might be called uh, objects of value, yet they're not pre-given. They're not just uh, object of conjunction and disjunction, but uh, you might with one strategy of performance, you can produce and others you can uh, not produce. So it makes a difference what you produce and what you don't produce. And uh, there is a consumption of resources. And that's why uh, semi-economic is a, a bit metaphorical thing because people from economy, from economics uh, are, totally estranged to, to, to these reflections as well. Now, one of the mm, very important scholars of, of, of video games introduced this slogan. It is a title of a chapter of Castronova's uh, uh, book on um, um, artificial worlds, video games, uh, particular kind of video games, which he's uh, um, analyzing. And so uh, he's the scholar who uh, introduced the economic uh, vocabulary into video game studies. But video game, again, it's almost synonymous with interactive experience. It is just a, a difference in level, not in um, essence. So scarcity is fun. Let's reflect on this. the whole model on the economic value of, of the sign, which I'm uh, trying to use in order to understand and to uh, translate interactive experiences into semiotic models is based on scarcity. The money sign, if we take the money sign, the coin or the banknote or even the digital record, all they have meaning understand value only if someone somewhere takes care that they are not reproduced in infinite way. This is the biggest difference between the money sign and the linguistic side. The linguistic sign is arbitrarily and infinitely reproducible in order to create textual reality, which is not constrained from this point of view by the um, let's say the constraints of reality. There is no resistance on this side. On the contrary, the money signs, which are extremely important in our everyday life, actually they allow in a, in a global sense, people to calculate future. We calculate future through uh, money sign, through our financial resources. They are important reality of uh, projecting future. That's why uh, money sign is important. But again, if you need more on this, I have the whole bibliography. I cannot go here uh, deeper. So scarcity is a basic principle, which is the condition of possibility for the economic sign. 
economic signs, you cannot any economic sign which um, transfers economic value should be limited in number. Like, uh, you know, when uh, the Spanish conquistadors uh, brought a lot of gold from the New World into Europe, there was an inflation because there were so many golden coins uh, uh, cut in this period, uh, coined in this period, that uh, actually provoked an, uh, an inflation. And then before that, Mer mercantilist thought was uh, convinced that the more gold, the more uh, richness, the more wealth you have. But actually, when there was too much gold and the economic performance was almost the same, then um, the value of this gold uh, decreased because there, were, there was no scarcity in gold anymore for a very short period of time, obviously, then uh, everything went to, uh, in its equilibrium. But now uh, we had only 20 years ago in, in Bulgaria, 24 years ago in Bulgaria, big inflation. So our currency lost uh, like uh, 10 times or 100 times its value. And we were witness of this kind of the state prints money and they lose value. So scarcity is the fundamental principle of the money sign. And what happens with the scarcity inside video games? Actually, the scarcity is fun. The scarcity is the premise to have intrigue into a video game or in any interactive experience uh, seen as uh, extension of the video game uh, principles. So scarcity is fun means that uh, you have uh, uh, interest to play a game only when you have a limited number of lives, when you have a limited uh, time available, when you have a limited energy or whatever. There, are, there is a huge variety of video games in which your resources are running out. And according to Castro Novo, which I understand this slogan with both hands, scarcity is fundamental to understand uh, why interactive experiences are making meaning, making sense to us. So the um, proposal here goes to uh, define in a formal terms, uh, taking all the, um, let's say, uh, ideas from the um, generative approach into the interactive game. What would be a dynamic object of value? This means object of value, which is not given and uh, defined only as conjunct or disjunct from the subjects of state and subjects of action, but a uh, dynamic object of value, which is produced during the game. And here we come with the, I don't know, the most famous video game the most famous video game, which uh, now I'm trying to illustrate through Tetris, which I hope uh, everyone has seen and everyone has played. played. But uh, actually, when people reflect why Tetris is so popular is that it does not need an introduction to, to start to play. Everyone can start immediately uh, play, so it's quite obvious. Now, dynamic object of value means that in a different stages of the gameplay, of the interactive experience, you have uh, a different value with the, for the same object. You see, um, when you have a lot of time, like, um, I hope you can see my uh, mouse. When you have um, this situation here at the beginning, actually, you have a, plenty of time. Obviously, you can accelerate the, the dropping, in, but to, before you take the decision, before uh, your action uh, takes place, somehow um, you have more relaxed situation. The value of time here is less, is smaller. The value of time here is, you create lines, the final object in uh, Tetris, the uh, object of, of the goal, the narrative goal is to form lines without, you know, full lines and they disappear and they give you the satisfaction of achievement. So the more lines you accomplish, the further you go, the longer your gameplay is, and so on. This is the um, narrative goal, as we will see uh, after a while, of this uh, gameplay. So you allocate these uh, pieces into the uh, slots. So it depends on your skills, on your... When you have situation like here, the value of the object is different. Here, every line you compose 
is more valuable than here because here you have a lot of room for errors. Well, here you're very close to the end and you are in a kind of panic. So yes, object of value, you achieve the same wines, but when you achieve them here, it's a different intensity, different object of They cause those who play a lot, um, Tetris, they know how precious are those particular elements when you have situation in which uh, only this element can enter into uh, you know a, a place and then you have four wines accomplished only with one element so it is extremely precious this is kind of a commercial object of value but this object of value also depends on the the, the situation here so it's a dynamic object of value it's dynamic because it's temporal dimension here time is scarce then scarcer than here and also as a shape you have different expenditure you see this element here is expanded very well here it is requested here it is the the, the uh, where it value uh, goes in its uh, utmost uh, realization so this is what i mean with semi-economic in any kind of experience i think we have let me just check uh, okay we have one more here but probably it's behind the the, the, the images uh, just to illustrate what might be the idea of dynamic object of uh, value. Now, scarcity of time and higher value for performance is uh, uh, go in this uh, direction. And a term which many of you might not like because many times this is uh, expression of the capitalist principle of the free market, it is the marginal utility. So. Uh, to understand the dynamics of a gameplay, we can borrow this notion from the uh, economic theory, which means here the marginal utility of uh, the right element uh, which you need in order to accomplish wines is bigger than here. The marginal utility here is bigger than here. So um, this uh, notion might be this is my proposal uh, employed also for more complex narrative uh, interactive experiences tetris is very basic tetris is schematic uh, no. okay um tetris is schematic and uh, here i'm trying to um give ideas what are the uh, scarce uh, resources and the, the goals, the narrative goals, which every narrative program of uh, interactive experiences tries to achieve. Uh, they are um, determined by Voodoo Productive. Voodoo Production is uh, conjunction and disjunction might be uh, substituted by Voodoo Productive goals. So you need to produce something in order to achieve experience, in order to extend the narrative, in order to uh, transform the interactive experiences, which depends upon your decisions, upon your skills, and it is not fixed in a uh, writing as is the. Scarcity is mean, is fun means that the quality of play experience, and I would say the condition of possibility in general depends on the relation between the goals and the scarcity constraints of the means for their achievement. Most often video games or interactive experiences create time-based constraints of explicit countdowns of seconds or an accelerated velocity of action or limited number of lives, but also scarcity of power, energy, weapons, as well as explicit economic assets such as money, property, productivity. There is a huge creativity in a video game narrative worlds, but as I claim, there is always resources. There is always scarcity. There is always a uh, allocation of a record. Now, um, um, probably here uh, I launch a, a, a hypothesis which might be discussed. We have semi-narrative structures, we have semi-discursive um, structures. Now, Tetris, I would say, 
if we allocate it on a level of the generative trajectory, it is very much a game on a semi-narrative structures because Tetris is abstract. You cannot see an explicit um, narrative development there. And actually many, not many, but at least few scholars have tried to uh, convince uh, their readers that Tetris is a narrative uh, game, but uh, very essential. I would uh, claim rather that there is something archetypical for every interactive experience into the Tetris uh, game, as far as it is in a very clear, explicit form, uh, expenditure, allocation of resources, uh, very easily the value of uh, the same element change with the advancement with every next level there are different let's say uh, trade conditions and this is very archetypical for um, being into an interactive experience so what might be a semi-discursive structure now here is the uh, the point uh, i studied a little bit the experience of this game sims i think that in sims where you create uh, life in a very narrative form sims is a game where you simulate it's an artificial life game so you may you may play sims months you create a life of a family then you can create a city then you can create whatever it's very franchise very developed Gameplay. Anyway, you create a possible world in many steps. You may create a romance. This is the point. And uh, the resources you have on disposition are very much schematized in Tetris. I mean, these uh, two games, it is just an idea why um, certain games are narrative and certain experiences, interactive experiences, we get involved into are more narrative than others. But yet, when you have resources, when you have a, a situation in which your decisions are requested, you're already into the interactive experience. And your interactive experience is all about uh, managing resources to achieve narrative goals. These narrative goals are very schematic, very basic, very, uh, let's say, logical and mathematic if you reduce Tetris to uh, formal description. And they are much more narrative, much more uh, already uh, written text-like or written novel-like or uh, very close to the conventional narrative uh, text which we are used to analyze in semiotics when you go into reality as sims. By the way, where did the idea come to me uh, from sims? It is that my wife, when she was in high school, actually, uh, she was playing entire months this Sims and uh, her dream was to create, actually her dream in Sims was to marry Leonardo DiCaprio. And actually she created her wife, her family with uh, her, uh, you know, uh, favorite uh, star. And then for months, uh, she was creating their family wife with all the elements and resources she had in this position, but she failed many times, by the way, probably that's why she came. Because the family is very difficult to keep in this uh, game and you have resources and they are very dynamic and uh, certain decisions of yours might bring to the uh, unhappiness of your partner and uh, the destruction of the marriage. And uh, this may happen there. So it's a novel-like uh, uh, game, yet you have resources that are very similar it is kind of discursive level of uh, a schematic uh, allocation of resources, which you can see in its basic form in uh, uh, Tetris. So you, uh, I mean, why for many Tetris is uh, the greatest video game ever? You can Google this and see how many people think uh, that it's very basic, it is archetypical. It's like the Edip story, you know, Levi Strauss. So in the Edip complex, uh, and the, the myth of, uh, of Edip, uh, something very archetypal for any kind of uh, mythological thinking. <laughs> Allow me to, to say that uh, most of the narrative games in here, 
it is just I pick up logos of many games to put all games are here because Tetris and other uh, games like Tetris uh, with the similar principles might be the same narrative structure and same narrative level of uh, uh, performance for uh, many others which are extended narrative like which are inspired by fictional works uh, by fictional characters and so on and so far now the possible application of sem the semi-economic method uh, has the same purpose as the structuralist methods to understand how meaning making works how meaning making works in um, interactive text uh, in uh, interactive experiences is there uh, meaning meaning at all i think yes it is meaning but it is a different kind of meaning which is not the same as the textualist uh, approach might presuppose so analyzing the expected narrative goals the potential and the performance in a staged serial experience for instance for designers of serial uh, staged experiences such kind of semi-economic analysis may give uh, hints to improve the value of the objects which are inside to improve the mm, internal economy because every stage of a uh, interactive performance have a different economy might be formalized in, as a different market as a different level of uh, uh, values of the exchanged and uh, achieved goals and here probably uh, every those who does not like uh, uh, football uh, probably will say this is completely crazy but actually one of the um, fields in which we have ex extremely well-developed um, analysis of an experience, of interactive experiences. This is the football experience analysis. Believe me, this is a multi-million dollar business, the analysis of football experiences. There are very expensive uh, tools which capture the movement of the players on the screen. And there is a lot of know-how very complicated algorithmic methods to understand how the football game works in order to understand better its performance. It's a formalization. They do not need, obviously, the same economic approach in order to do it because it has been developed in recent times in great detail, but it gives me ideas where the analysis of the interactive experiences can be. We may analyze the mm, Similar experiences. Sport is one uh, and a very substantial element of our everyday life, but not necessarily the, the only one. The entertainment industry is developing in a um, big variety of, uh, of directions, and this gamification process expands the principles of interactivity and the gameplay into various aspects of our lives. So um, an idea what might look like and where the semi-economic analysis of interactive experiences uh, might go. It won't be alone because already in most of the sports, but especially in, in football, already it works. It is formalized analysis of the living experience on the pitch and many of the companies which offer, which sell for uh, huge amounts of money, the uh, uh, data on the base of which this uh, the gameplay is analyzed, they are used by coaches, by the, the, the professionals, by the football players themselves in order to understand better what was their performance in order to, and uh, the, one example, and I finish, is um, for instance, uh, you can calculate the expected goals in football. And this is very important because not, goals are very rare thing in football. But when you have um, an estimation calculation of uh, the structure of the game, which shows that one of the team deserves to score more goals, this brings you more information, more understanding of the living experience rather than the mere uh, result expressed. Because there is a lot of fortune in the mere result, but there is uh, uh, science and analysis behind the expected goals uh, uh, analysis of the uh, gameplay. So these are the work in progress because uh, textual and interactive, just to put the, the, the highlights of the distinction between the two 
uh, methods, but it is not accomplished. So I stop here because I'm open to uh, discuss this and to any kind of feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian, for your uh, uh, inspiring presentation and insight information to the world of interactivity. Uh, we are now able to accept questions from the audience. We have uh, 10 minutes to um, ask uh, um, the, the keynote presenter any questions or share our thoughts with him. Are there any hands from the audience? Christian, um, I, I, I would like to ask you, uh, and if someone else would like to join in, uh, in, in your presentation, which other parameters you, you would consider as major parameters for semiotic uh, interference in interactive environments, for example, um, music or sound effects would also uh, influence this interactivity and contribute to the notion of scarcity while you, you have uh, presented to us. The notion of of Casting. Yes. Uh, okay. Now um, it depends how the design of the experience uh, involves this. If we imagine a experience somewhere where you need to get, as for instance, with the performer of a song, probably this is a gameplay. It will be a value. It is involved. So your knowledge is scarce. You need to find out who made what, and then you gain points or you enter into formal relations with other players according to your uh, performance. If music is just the background, like in almost every video game, you have uh, interesting music play, then it is not part of the this dynamic narrative program. Uh, it's probably it's a federal for instance in um, fifa video game one of the most famous video games uh, uh, with the advancement of the editions of this game you have more and more realistic soundscape and probably at a certain point the soundscape also entered because you have the commentator the uh, analyst then you have the sound of the public and uh, many elements which part would call a federal yet they are not part of the economy of the gameplay because the gameplay is what happens on the pitch the resources you have the time the uh, velocity of interaction and things like that they are uh, into economic uh, let's say uh, dynamic interplay and the rest is just helping you to enter this uh, fictional world in more uh, immersive way okay Thank you. Um, what to say um, that um, the, the way you are investigating uh, video games and the interactive uh, environments, would you see uh, uh, the involvement of algorithms to predict uh, um, the meaning and the consequences? In, in a different real life environment, for example, uh, applying your idea and research in, in the way that political games, for example, are, um, are evolving in, in various regions in the Balkans or um, in, in, in the Middle East or wh wherever there are what we, would say, what we would say political games in the same way. And now, uh Thank you for these political games. You mean the real ones, which are very gamified nowadays with all the populist, all the social media battles. They are really like um, Arcadia video games. You know, politicians shoot to each other with uh, social media and they uh, react to, to this. And there is uh, the, involvement, the, the major resource is the media. So they try to involve the media. 
it might be uh, the difficulty in uh, analyzing the real video uh, games is the lack of seriality because uh, their usually situations are unique and i think the most uh, aware the most you know this populist which game gained a lot of influence in recent time like brexit and trump they were the first to gamify the political experience and to give up entirely the serious political uh, communication, the uh, commitment with programs, with messages, and to go into social media and to put their programs into gamified uh, way. I see uh, much, uh, let's say, easy to uh, illustrate application of this kind of analysis as far as we think how uh, teaching and the university education might be gamified because many private universities already work in this direction. So the teaching process is a bit, um, you know, put with uh, points, with teams, teams which uh, fight against each other, I myself put the kind of competition of uh, debate organized with strict rules which are taken from uh, video games. Now, um, I think if we analyze uh, education, higher education, our courses, if we gamify them, if we divide people into courses, if we're in the room and we put different uh, uh, jerseys of the, of the students and involve them in an interactive experience, which outcome is uh, learning in a more let's say entertaining way, the same content as they would learn only uh, listening to the uh, professor, then it's for me very easy to define in a formal terms the created economy, because this economy will depend on time of their answers, eventually on um, resources they can have in uh, bigger or smaller, for instance, if you make competition by internet dependent, internet not dependent and things like that. So it won't be difficult for me to put uh, analysis and then to calibrate each next time to be better uh, staged than the, the, the time before. Very interesting, Christian. I, I'm afraid. I hope I am the only one who sees a frozen image. We've missed. Uh, I've missed your last bit, but I, I get your message very well. I, I have also received a notice from the organizers that we we need to close these sessions uh, unless there is anyone who would like to make a quick question to Christian. Uh, I see no hands. Uh, uh, yes, please. Yes, yes. Hi, Christian. Uh, thank you so much for your conference. Hello. Hello. My uh, question is about the narrative program, uh, conjunction or disjunction with the object of value, stat static or dynamic. Uh, um, the object of value is one of the main terms of uh, Grimacian semiotics, especially semiotics of passions. So uh, what place uh, does uh, this approach take in your research? Maybe the question. Hmm. It's a very good point. I must say that semiotics of passion, a private opinion. Uh, while I was a student, uh, student in Bologna, actually this book appeared for the first time. It was very topical at the moment, but allow me to say that this was already a direction in which um, generative semiotics didn't in its best, uh, in its best. It has to do with interaction and with um, you know, passion is about the, a very dynamic aspect. It should be started from the
in a, have you been listening to Christian? Because I've lost him myself. Yeah, I'm sorry. Not all. Not all. The connection is not good. Yeah. But I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you because the next session is is closing down automatically. Thank you very much, Christian, for your presentation. And, and Thank you. Ina, I will answer you in the first possible oh, okay. occasion. Okay, nice. Thank, Thank you, you, Christian. I'm sorry, the connection. Thank you, everyone. Have a good continuation of the conference. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.